Bom dia. Embaixador John Ash, presidente Ambassador John Ash, da 60 president of the 60, 68th Assembly General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the United Nations. Excelentíssimos senhores chefes de Estado, Your Excellencies, heads of state and heads of government, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, allow me to briefly express just how pleased I am to see a distinguished representative of Antigua and Barbuda, a country that is part and parcel of the Caribbean and that is so dear to Brazil and to our region at the helm of the proceedings of this session of the General Assembly. Your Excellency, you can certainly rely on the permanent support of the Brazilian government. May I also, at the very beginning of my address, express the repudiation of the Brazilian government and people to the recent terrorist attack that took place in Nairobi. I would like to convey our condolences as well as our solidarity to the families of victims as well as the people and the government of Kenya. Terrorism, wherever it may happen, and no matter where it comes from, shall always deserve our unambiguous condemnation as well as our firm determination to tackle it. We shall never compromise with barbaric acts of violence. Mr. President, I wish to bring to the attention of attending delegations an issue which I view as being utterly important and serious. Recently disclosed information on the activities carried out by a global network of electronic spying has brought about anger and repudiation in vast sectors of public opinion worldwide. In Brazil, the situation was even more serious, since we, Brazil, feature as a target of such an intrusion. Citizens' personal data and information have been indiscriminately targeted and intercepted. Business information, oftentimes of high economic and even strategic value, have been the target of spying activity. Also, communications by Brazilian diplomatic representation offices, including the permanent mission of Brazil with the United Nations and even the very presidency of Republic of Brazil, were subject to interception of communications. Meddling in such a manner in the life and affairs of other countries is a breach of international law and, as such, it is an affrontment to the principles that should otherwise govern relations among countries, especially among friendly nations. A country's sovereignty can never affirm itself to the detriment of another country's sovereignty. The right to security of a country's citizens can never be ensured by violating the fundamental human and civil rights of another country's citizens. Even worse, when private sector companies uphold this type of spying activity. The argument that illegal interception of information and data is allegedly intended to protect nations against terrorism is untenable. Mr. President, Brazil knows how to protect itself. Brazil, Mr. President, repudiates Brazil, tackles and does not provide shelter to terrorist groups. We are a democratic country, surrounded by democratic, peaceful countries that respect international law. We have been living in peace with our neighbors for more than 140 years. Like so many other Latin Americans, I myself fought on a first-hand basis against arbitrary behavior and censorship, and I could therefore not possibly fail to uncompromisingly defend individuals' rights to privacy and my country's sovereignty. Without the right to privacy, there is no real freedom of speech or freedom of opinion, and therefore there is no actual democracy. 
Without respect to sovereignty, there is no base for proper relations among nations. What we have before us, Mr. President, is a serious case of violation of human rights and civil liberties, a case of invasion and capture of confidential secret information pertaining to business activities, and above all, a case of disrespect to national sovereignty, the national sovereignty of my country. We have let the U.S. government know about our protest by demanding explanations, apologies and guarantees that such acts or procedures will never be repeated again. Friendly governments and societies that seek to consolidate a truly strategic partnership, such as is our case, cannot possibly allow recurring and illegal actions to go on as if they were normal, ordinary practice. Such actions are totally unacceptable. Mr. President, Brazil will further double its efforts to equip itself with legislation, technologies and the mechanisms that will protect us properly against illegal interception of communications and data. My administration will do everything within its reach and powers to defend the human rights of all Brazilians and to protect or in the human rights of all citizens in the world while protecting the fruits of the ingenious efforts of Brazilian workers and corporations. The problem, however, goes beyond the bilateral relations of two countries. It affects the international community itself and as such requires an answer from it. Information and communications or telecommunications technologies cannot become a new battlefield among states. The time has come for us to foster the conditions required to prevent that the cyberspace becomes or be instrumentally manipulated as a weapon of war by means of spying activities, sabotage and attacks against the systems and infrastructures owned by third-party countries. The United Nations Organization should perform a leadership role in an effort to properly regulate the behavior of states regarding these technologies and also consider the importance of the Internet and social networks as part of our efforts to build democracy worldwide. For that reason, Mr. President, Brazil will put forth proposals aimed at establishing a multilateral civil framework for internet governance and use, as well as measures to ensure effective protection of the data and information trafficking through the internet. We must establish multilateral mechanisms for the World Wide Web, mechanisms that are capable of ensuring materialization of principles such as, for example, number one, freedom of, freedom of speech, individuals' privacy and respect to human rights. Principle number two, democratic governance, multilateral, democratic and open governance, exercise with a sense of transparency while encouraging collective creation and a broad-ranging participation of society, governments and the private sector. Third, is the principle of universality that ensures social and human development as well as the construction of inclusive, non-discriminatory societies. The fourth is the principle of cultural diversity without any imposition of beliefs, customs or values. Principle number five, that of network neutrality by observing only technical and ethical criteria, thus making unacceptable any restriction due to political, commercial, religious reasons or any other reason. Full utilization of the Internet's potential therefore involves responsible regulation that will at the same time guarantee freedom of speech, security and respect to human rights. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the choice of the post-2015 development agenda as the theme of this session of the General Assembly could not be more timely. The fight against poverty, hunger and inequality constitutes the biggest challenge of our times. For that reason, in Brazil, we have put in place an economic model coupled with social inclusion, one that is ultimately anchored on the creation of jobs and strengthening of family farming, expansion of credit availability, appreciation in the value of workers' wages, and the construction of a broad-ranging social protection network, particularly by means of our family stipend program.
In addition to the above-mentioned accomplishments and gains we have uplifted from extreme poverty, 22 million Brazilians through the Brazil Free of Extreme Poverty Plan within no more than two years. We have drastically reduced child mortality in Brazil. A recent UNICEF report highlights Brazil as a country that has fostered one of the major drops in the child mortality indicator in the whole world. Children are a top priority for Brazil. This is translated in our commitment to education. We are the one country in the world that has most increased public investment in the educational sector, according to the latest OECD report. By means of law, we have now earmarked 75% of all oil revenues to education and 25% to the health sector. Mr. President, in the debate on the 20 or post-2015 development agenda, we should focus on the results attained at the Rio Plus 20 conference as key drivers. The major step we took in Rio de Janeiro consisted in placing poverty at the very center of the sustainable development agenda. Poverty, Mr. President, is not a problem that is peculiar only to developing countries, and environmental protection is not a goal to be pursued only only when poverty has been overcome. The meaning and the purpose of the post-2015 agenda are about building a world in which it is possible to grow, to include, to conserve and to protect. Mr. President, by promoting social mobility and by overcoming extreme poverty as we have been doing, we have established a huge contingent of citizens who now enjoy better standards of living and have greater access to information and a keen awareness of their rights. Citizens who are now endowed with new hopes, new wishes and new demands. The June demonstrations in Brazil are an inseparable part of our process of building democracy and social change. My administration did not crack down on those street demonstrations. Much on the contrary, we listened to and understood the voices coming from the streets. We listened to and understood their voices because we ourselves came from the streets. We were educated day to day and became who we are as part of the great struggles of Brazil. The streets are our ground, our base. The demonstrators did not ask for a return to the past. Rather, demonstrators did ask for further progress towards a future of more rights, more participation and even more social gains. In Brazil, it was in this decade that we saw the greatest reduction in inequality in the past 50 years. It was in this decade that we established a social protection system that has allowed us to now virtually overcome extreme poverty. We know all too well that democracy breeds more desire for more democracy. Social inclusion breeds demands for even more social inclusion. Quality of life awakens people's yearning for even more quality of life. In our view, all of the progress made so far is always just a beginning. Our development strategy requires more, very much in line with the yearnings and wishes of all Brazilians. For that reason, it is not enough to hear or listen to them. It is necessary to do more, to change this extraordinary energy into achievements to the benefit of all. For that reason, I have recently, recently launched five major pacts. The Pact Against Corruption and for Political Reform, the Pact for Urban Mobility, aimed at improving public transportation and at fostering an urban reform. A Pact for Education, our great passport to the future, with support from the Oil Resources Revenues and the Oil Social Fund. The Pact for Health, which provides for doctors to assist and save the lives of Brazilians who live in the most remote and poorest corners of the country. The Pact for Social, rather fiscal, responsibility in order to ensure feasibility of, it, of this new stage in our history. Ladies and gentlemen, although the most acute phase of the crisis is now behind us, the fact remains that the world's economic situation remains fragile with unacceptable unemployment levels.
ILO statistics point out that there are more than 200 million unemployed people worldwide. The phenomenon affects the population of both developed and developing countries. This is the right time for us to strengthen the trends for growth in the world's economy, trends that are pointing towards signs of recovery. Emerging countries alone cannot ensure resumption of global growth. More than ever before, it is necessary to engage in concerted action in order to reduce unemployment and reestablish momentum in international national trade. We are all on the same boat. My country is restoring growth despite the impact of the international crisis in the past few years. We have relied on three key elements. Number one, commitment towards sound macroeconomic policies. Number two, continuing and upholding successful social inclusion policies. And number three, adoption of measures aimed at increasing our productivity and therefore our international competitiveness. We are committed to stability, to inflation control, to improving the quality of public spending and to upholding proper fiscal performance. We re re reiterate, Mr. President, our support to a reform of the IMF. Governance of the funds should reflect the weight of emerging and developing countries in the world's economy. Delaying this adaptive reform will further reduce the fund's legitimacy and effectiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, the year 2015 will mark the 70th anniversary of the United Nations and the 10th anniversary of the World Summit of 2005. As such, it will be an occasion for us to carry out the urgent reform that we have been calling for since that first summit. We must avoid a collective defeat of coming to 2015 without a Security Council capable of fully exercising its responsibilities in today's world. The limited representation of the United Nations Security Council in view of the new challenges of the 21st century is a source of grave concern. Examples of that concern include the huge difficulty in offering a solution to the ongoing Syrian conflict and the state of paralysis in addressing the Israeli-Palestinian question. On important issues, the recurring polarization among permanent members has led to a dangerous inaction. The Council must be urgently endowed with voices that are both independent and constructive. Only by expanding the number of permanent and non-permanent members of the Security Council and by including developing countries in both categories, will it be possible to solve and overcome the current representativeness and legitimacy deficit that the Council suffers from? Mr. President, the general debate provides us with an opportunity to reiterate the fundamental principles that guide my country's foreign policy and inform our stance on hot and pressing issues of today's international agenda. We guide ourselves and actions on a defense of a multilateral world, a world governed by international law, where peaceful solution of conflicts prevail, and also where the pursuit of a fair and solidarity-based order prevail, both economically and socially. The crisis in Syria has caused commotion and breeds a sense of anger. Two and a half years of lost lives and destruction have caused the biggest humanitarian disaster of the century. Brazil, whose population of Syrian descent is an important component of our national identity, is deeply involved with this plight. It is necessary to prevent the killing of innocent people women, children, and the elderly. It is necessary to silence weapons, whether conventional or chemical, whether used by the government or by the rebels. There is no military way out. The only solution is through negotiation, dialogue, and understanding. Syria's decision to accede to the Convention on the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons and enforce it immediately was an important development. The measure, as such, is decisive 
to overcome the conflict and helps build a world free of chemical weapons. The use of such weapons, I stress, is heinous and unacceptable under any circumstances. We therefore support the agreement reached between the United States and Russia to eliminate serious chemical weapons. It is incumbent upon the Syrian government to fulfill it in its entirety and do so in good faith and in a spirit of cooperation. Under any circumstances and in any case we repudiate unilateral interventions in contempt of international law and without authorization by the Security Council. That would only further worsen the lack of political stability in the region and would further increase human suffering. Likewise, a lasting peace between Israel and Palestine has taken on a new and pressing dimension given the sweeping changes that the Middle East is currently going through. The time has come for one to meet the legitimate, as the legitimate Palestinian aspirations to an independent and sovereign state. The time has also come for us to materialize the ample international consensus for a two-state solution. Current talks between Israelis and Palestinians should yield practical and significant results towards an agreement. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the history of the 21st, rather the history of the 20th century shows that giving up the multilateral system is a prelude to wars with the ensuing trail of human destitution and devastation. The history of the 20th century also shows that promoting the multilateral system yields fruits on the ethical, political and institutional fronts. May I thus renew an appeal for an ample and vigorous convergence of political will that will uphold and reinvigorate the multilateral system, of which the United Nations is the main pillar. When the United Nations organization was founded, people, the peoples of the world rallied around the hope that humankind would be able to overcome the wounds of World War II, the hope that, yes, it would be possible to rebuild from the debris of destruction and massacre a new world of liberty, solidarity and prosperity. We all have the responsibility not to let die such a generous hope such a generous and fruitful hope. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.